don't come to Tokyo. Hi, welcome to the Black Experience Japan's Melanated Files. The purpose of this series is to highlight the black people living in Japan. Who are they? My name is Jason Gatewood. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, kind of grew up all over the United States. Uh, New York City, Los Angeles, Atlanta. Most recently, Atlanta is where I would call home. What drew me to Japan was, well, when I was in junior high school, uh, my family made a move to uh, Los Angeles, Inglewood, California. And uh, there's a city to the south of there called Torrance. It was one of those places where there was a lot of Japanese American people living. And I had to go there once a week for a school workshop. And uh, I started getting involved with like uh, other kids my age who were who just happened to be Japanese. And I picked up a little bit of the culture and I was like, wow, this is cool. You know, it's like 1990 something. and. You know, the big thing with like Pokemon and like uh, anime and stuff really hadn't caught on yet. So I was kind of like, it was very new to me. No one had known about this stuff. So uh, 12 year old, 13 year old me was like, wow, these games are better than ours. Wow, these cartoons are better than ours. Wow, these comic books are better than ours. I want to learn this language so I can figure out what's going on. So fast forward to me being in college. And it was the first time I could take uh, Japanese as a language. And I found that for some reason I had a propensity more than Spanish and any other language I tried to just speak it. And then I just made a go at trying to come over here. I was working for a big media company at the time and they needed somebody to come over here and do production work for them here in the uh, Tokyo office. And so in 2000, I uh, came over here and I've been over here on and off ever since. Uh, right now, I work as a kind of a project coordinator and a uh, media studies uh, teacher at a big university here in town. And I also work as a freelance journalist for a couple of top uh, worldwide media companies as well. 18 years, but not continuously. Um, I first arrived here uh, in 2000, and then I worked my contract and then I left. Um, and I left for about almost a year and I came back in 2001 as a student. And I was an exchange student in Osaka for a period of time and then after that program was up, I uh, graduated from my university uh, in St. Louis. Lived in Atlanta for about three or four years almost. But I was still coming back here because I have many friends here. Um, almost every year I was coming back and visiting and then uh, decided in 2008, nope, I'm gonna move back to Japan. And I've been here ever since. First and foremost, I like the freedom that Japan allows me. I think, I can't really say whether or not that I would experience the same amount of freedom going into another, like if I'd have gone to Korea or if I'd have gone to like Germany or someplace like that, maybe the same thing because when you get out of your, the culture that you grew up in and go to a different place, you know, it's a little bit difficult and it's a little bit taxing on the mind, but you also experience a little bit of freedom because you get to erase the slate and kind of build your own your own future. You're, you're writing on a new board at that point. So when I came here in 2000, that was probably the first thing I noticed. Uh, the other thing that I like about Japan is the fact that there is no prejudice in the traditional American sense of the, of the word. Um, of course, I'm African-American, so, and moreover, I'm from the part of America that is kind of used to that, being from the South. But here, if there is a prejudice towards me, it's me as an outsider first. Not necessarily anything that I can control, of course, but it's not the same. It's, it's kind of a weird way of putting it, but... Uh, I would rather be, if I'm going to be prejudged by anybody, which is still bad, I'd, I'd rather be prejudiced on the fact that I'm totally 100% different from the culture and everybody that lives within it, rather than being a part of something as I am in a, as an American. And the only difference is that I happen to have like a higher melanin content, if that means anything. So again, that's one of the freedoms though. And then the other fact is, I would say 99.9% .9 of Japanese people don't give me any kind of, you know, prejudiced feelings. They're genuinely curious about, you know, where I come from and what I do and 
uh, why I can speak Japanese and the same the same questions that you're asking me. I think that's what I like about it the most. And then, of course, the other thing, too, is I'm always learning here. There's always something to learn. Uh, you know, I, I, every day I go someplace and I, I learn something new. I have students that teach me. Uh, I have uh, I can turn on the news and there's always just something new. My mind is constantly working. There's no chance to be lazy here. <laughs> So I think from that standpoint, um, you know, they say that in order to remain young, your mind must constantly be active. And I, and I know from living here over the past like 18 years, like, yeah, my mind is always active here. So, okay. So the thing that I like the least about Japan are some of the things that I kind of took for granted in America kind of the commonsensical things that as an American, I would feel that, yeah, everybody does this, right? For example, it's about to be winter time here in Japan. And we're in, you know, the peak of oh, Samui Desune weather, right? Samui Desune means, oh, it's cold, isn't it? Japanese houses don't have insulation in them. <laughs> and so even Tokyo, which gets down to like, you know, freezing temperatures in the winter time, you'll still only have like walls this thin. And, you know, as an American, anywhere I lived in America, like, you know, when you enter the house, you can take off your coat, you can take off your jacket, you know, you can get comfortable in your own house. There's central heating. There isn't that sort of thing in most places in Japan. So I, you know, when I go to sleep at night, for example, I take off my street clothes and I put on like a track suit. <laughs> so it looks like I'm just about to go work out. Other things I don't like, the, the conveniences I kind of miss. Like in America, I'm used to going to one grocery store for everything. Here, if I want to cook a meal, unless I'm making a very Japanese meal, I have to go to maybe three or four grocery stores. Although that's kind of changing now because just like everywhere else in, uh, in the world, we have delivery services now. So that's a little bit better than it was before when I first got here. Finally, I think the big thing that I don't like about Japan uh, kind of leads me back to being African-American and just foreign in general here. Uh, I don't like being lumped in with other foreigners when uh, like on a macro scale. Case in point, like I've been discriminated against in terms of trying to find a place to live three times where my first choice for uh, an apartment that I wanted to live in was turned down simply because I was a foreigner. And when I asked for a reason, in one case, it was because the landlord had a foreign tenant once upon a time, and he said that that guy constantly had problems sorting his garbage, uh, recyclables. And so that was the reason why he was refusing me. But I would also say that the whole discrimination part about being a foreigner here in Japan, especially in places like Tokyo and Osaka, and even Nagoya now, um, all three places which I've lived, it's kind of, it's not totally 100% going away, but it's a lot less than it used to be because just like everywhere else, you know, Japan has kind of like got this influx of people coming from other countries living here now. So that's a good thing. I think. Being black in Japan, my first experience was, of course, I, I had just moved to Osaka and maybe my second or third day in Osaka, I went down to the central part, uh, Namba, uh, at Metakamura, and I'm walking down the street and I, I didn't know anybody and I could barely speak any Japanese at the time. And I look over and see another black man uh, with very long dreadlocks and he's surrounded by like all these Japanese people and he seems to be the center of attention and uh, Everyone's having a grand old time. It's like an outdoor cafe and I kind of like looked over in his direction a little bit like oh wow There's another black guy. Oh, that's cool because this is again. This is like 2001 I, I think and there weren't even that many black people even in Osaka and so I was like, oh, okay, another black guy. That's pretty awesome, all right. And he stopped his whole conversation. He stopped everything, stood up, came across the street just to greet me and say, hey man, you know, where are you from? He asked, he asked a little bit about myself. He happened to be from New York City and he was like, hey man, why don't you come and join us? You know, welcome to Japan. And so, Ever since then, it's just like I found out like, wow, you know, being black over here, there's a sense of community because we all have the same experience 
Uh, we have a base set of experiences, especially as African Americans, but even just like the greater African diaspora. Um, I, I was able to become friends with Nigerians and Ghanaians and people from Botswana and even South Africa and Jamaica and, you know, uh, England, you know, where I know I wouldn't have been able to have the same experience even within uh, America. So it's kind of a, a small community here because we still have we still have the skin that we're in and we still have no matter in the where in the world we go a base set of experiences to draw from so living over here together there's a sense of camaraderie and we can talk to each other as brothers and sisters you know equally because we're experiencing the same thing over here so that's that's kind of it and then it's in terms of relating to japanese people it's been i would say 99.9 .9 positive there's our culture that, um, you know, everybody knows. And of course, I didn't figure that part out until I got over here too. Hip hop culture is a big thing over here and it's a, it bridges things. I find that as a teacher, um, my students readily want to talk to me, you know, they want to come up and talk to me about music and pop culture because, hey, guess what? You know, they were looking at YouTube and there was a guy that looked like me on there. And I can go into any part of Japan and talk to the young people because that's what they're into. So uh, it made my job maybe a little bit easier. When I was younger, it kind of made it easier in the dating scene. Um, I'm pretty sure you've heard th this, these stories before about how it's, I would say, kind of easy for black guys to go to any, any bar and start talking to the ladies. That part, I would say, is mostly true. That's the icebreaker. You know, you don't have to work so much to start talking to, you know, people of the opposite sex here and maybe of the same sex. I don't know that part, but maybe so uh, if you're trying to date them. But you still have to have a little bit of panache and pizzazz. You still need to wow them. One of the tricks that a friend of mine told me once upon a time, for example, is don't use so much Japanese. And um, because it keeps the, that air of mystery going. Um, I think just like anywhere else, females are attracted to mysterious people. So they want that air of myst that mysticism, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm the total opposite. Like, I'm, I tend to be an open book when I start talking to people, so. <laughs> but I will say this, that uh, once you do get into a relationship, things will change rather drastically. You will be expected sometimes to be more Japanese. Uh, there will be the little nuances that you'll have. Like, for example, once I was dating a girl and she got very furious with me because every time I would eat, I would leave little specks of rice in my bowl. And she was expecting me, you know, she cooked the meal because she would come over to my apartment sometimes and cook for me. To her, that was like disrespectful because I was leaving little specks of rice and I wasn't finishing the whole thing. And that's, again, that's maybe a little bit of a culture shock. So I would say if you do get into any kind of a cross-cultural relationship, it's important to be open and to be upfront. So you have, to, you have to figure out if you're dating over here, how to shift gears, how to go from being that mysterious, ooh, that guy's foreign, you know, ooh, I, I wanna learn more about him to, okay, I need you to tell me more about your culture so I can have these expectations. So the funniest thing that happens to me, not so much in these urban areas, but if I go into the rural areas, I'll just be minding my own business. And especially when I had longer hair, some old people or some young people will come up and just like out of nowhere, just start touching my hair like this, like no words, which is very weird because this is Japan and there's all, you know, everyone is very polite here you know one time i was like kind of minding my own business in the countryside in in aichi prefecture on the train and all of a sudden i see this hand just come out like this i'm like what's going on and then just on my hair and i turned around and it was some grandma and she's just like ah oh, chitty chitty nah. like that chitty chitty means kind of like wooly or nappy and so <laughs> That took some getting used to, but you know, uh, again, it's, it's, to me, it's funny. It's 
<laughs> your mileage may vary. Oh man, I have a lot of favorite Japanese foods. First and foremost were probably ramen. Um, ramen roughly translates to, you know, people think ramen here in Japan, Japanese people think ramen is a Chinese thing sometimes, but it's actually a wholly Japanese invention. You know, the Japanese are really good at taking something that's already there and remixing it. Um, and ramen is one of those things that they took from China and remixed it and made it their own. And I like it because it's a very regional dish that you can find all over. It's the American equivalent of barbecue, I think, in that respect. You know, there's Texas barbecue and Carolina barbecue and, you know, Missouri barbecue. Um, there's Yokohama ramen, Hokkaido ramen, uh, Kyushu ramen. So that's kind of my favorite thing. Um, and it's an easy conversation opener to uh, Japanese people. And then of course, I think my second favorite would be Okonomiyaki because I love Osaka. It's where I kind of got my legs here in Japan. And Okonomiyaki, it's a communal dish. The best life advice that I ever received was from my grandfather who sadly passed away not too long ago, a couple of years ago. He told me to learn a foreign language. And I remember the conversation. I was maybe in sixth grade or seventh grade in junior high school and I was visiting St. Louis for the summer from Los Angeles. And he asked me like, what's LA like, you know? And I said, oh, there's so many different people. There's so many different kinds of people. And at my school, you know, there's so many people speaking all these different languages. And he said, well, you know, you should learn, you should learn one of them. And I said, yeah, but learning a different language is so hard. Like I'm, I'm learning Spanish now and it's a little bit difficult. And he said, well, you know what? If you learn a different language and you get good in it, you can go to that country and you can make money. So if you learn, learn another language, it opens up doors. So I kind of had that kind of mindset when I jumped into Japanese and look where I am now. So I think that was the best life advice that I've ever received. So the worst kind of life advice that I've received was if I want to stay in Japan, I should marry somebody. And I, I didn't do that, obviously, because I'm not married now. <laughs> but I have seen people take that advice to stay here. And, you know, they only get married just solely so that they can they can stay here in Japan. Maybe there's a little bit of love involved, I don't know. But I've seen that go horribly wrong and nine times out of 10, there might be children involved. So I'm not, I'm not doing that. There should be no reason why you should, you know, unless it's a matter of life and death, you should know under no circumstances, marry out of convenience. If the world was listening to me right now, I want you to listen to uh, advice that comes from a man by the name of Mark Twain, who is also a fellow Missourian. I, I can't remember his exact quote, but I will paraphrase. He said, in order to get the most out of life, you should basically, in no certain terms, get the hell out of where you were born. Basically, you need to leave your comfort zone for a minute and go see the world, okay? And um, no one has ever come back from, you know, a little bit of travel, true travel. And I don't mean like, you know, glamping or taking guided tours with a group of your countrymen or something. I mean, getting out and living amongst the people. And then go, if you, when you go back to your town, when you go back to your hometown, you're, you're a changed person. Cause you've seen something and you've, you've, you've seen how big this world is. And you, you know that there are other versions of humanity. Nobody, having undertaken that has ever come back racist. Nobody after truly undertaking that has come back prejudiced. Nobody after, after going and seeing all those things have, has come back closed minded. So I urge you, you know, there's so much divide in the world. There's so much strife happening. And, you know, I'm a journalist and it's kind of my job to write about these things and to take pictures and show the world. There's people like me being killed because we're showing these things. So if I can't do it, you can do it. You know, I want to inspire you to get off of your couch, get off from in front of your, your phone or your computer where you're watching this video and get that ticket and come and see something that will take you out of your comfort zone for at least a couple of days. And then when you come back refreshed, I hope you're inspired. So if you're looking to come to Japan, number one, learn Japanese. 
<laughs> I'm going to say that right up front. Don't come here and expect that you can wing it speaking 100 percent English because that's not going to happen. The more Japanese that you already know when you get off the plane, the better for you. The second thing is don't come to Tokyo. If you truly want to have an ex a, a truly Japanese experience and be able to become more proficient in Japanese and become more efficient, more importantly, in the culture and things that are of Japan, find a more rural area or at least like a mid tier city. Go to some place again. I would say also go someplace where there aren't any black people. I know that's going to sound kind of the opposite of what maybe this video is supposed to be about, but when I, I lived in Osaka first and there were enough of us there at the time to kind of have our own community. Then I went to Nagoya and I think maybe when I first got there in 2008, there were like maybe six black folks that I knew. <laughs> um, and then that's out of like the 25 foreign people that I knew. There aren't there weren't very many foreigners even there. And I think I did the most growing here in Japan in that three year time period than I ever would have been able to do, especially in a place like here in uh, Tokyo, because I don't know if you've been paying attention to the people walking behind me, but I'm pretty sure there were a lot of foreign people. <laughs> Go someplace where there's mostly Japanese people, okay? Um, and then finally, I think my last piece of advice is figure out what part of you you can give to society here. For example, if you are a if you're musically inclined if you're artistically inclined share that with japan because we need it over here um japan is a very insular society we're surrounded by water 99 percent of everybody here is japanese so be willing to show what you can give to japan while you're coming over here to experience japan and you will have a better experience. Knowing Japanese kind of unlocked a lot of doors for me that uh, in the beginning, I guess I, you know, you're, it's kind of like feeling your way in the dark and then slowly a light comes on somewhere that gets brighter and brighter and you can see more and more of the room. When I first arrived here, like I had a rudimentary knowledge of Hiragata, Katakana and maybe like, maybe 50 to 100 or so kanji. Now that's like, you know, I have like a, high school level knowledge maybe a little bit more so i can go into a bank and i can conduct transactions i can go to a doctor i don't have to go and search for the english speaking doctor or dentist or, or hairstylist or whatever because i can explain in japanese you know what ails me or how i would like my hair to look or, or whatever it's more convenient because then you're not restricted to having to just float around the English speaking community. You can get up and go anywhere. Like one of my pastimes here is going off into the rural areas and doing a bit of photography. I'm also a rail fanner. I love trains and I like taking these long train rides into the countryside. And if I become lost or I want to learn a little bit about an area I've never been before, you know, I just go to the older people that live in that area and I sit down and I talk to them and it opens up a lot of doors. And especially here as a journalist where I'm assigned to kind of cult cover that part of Japan, I've been able to get jobs because of it. You know, the companies that I work for know that they can send me to any part of this country and I'll come back with something. As a teacher, I have to talk to students who have very low levels of English speaking ability if they have any English speaking ability at all. And, and, I'll, and in some cases, I have to talk to their parents. And it makes me, one, it, it helps me keep my job because I have to have this level of Japanese in order to have that job. Whereas if I didn't speak any Japanese at all, you're kind of, there's a, there's a serious glass ceiling here. So the more Japanese you learn the mo and know and use on a daily basis, the more socially mobile you become. So, yeah, you're you can you can float back and forth between two communities now as well. You know, you can have that 100 percent. You know, you're the only foreign person in that group of friends, Japanese uh, group of friends. And then you can also float back to the foreign community and then. In a lot of cases, you end up becoming that bridge and the center of attention. So if you're gregarious like that, there you go.
The way that I learned Japanese was I had a few classes in high school, of course, um, and in university level. But I think my biggest advice would be if you're really serious about learning the language, really take some time and carve out a day where you're doing everything in Japanese. Um, when I was living back home in Atlanta, kind of in between living in Osaka and living in Nagoya for that three year period, I actually had Japanese roommates. <laughs> Um, I had this huge apartment and I had a I had two friends of mine in Atlanta who were Japanese and we decided to like kind of like room together. And so, of course, if I'm dealing with them, you know, I got Japanese at home. Then uh, I went uh, further and made sure that one day a week I'm doing everything in Japanese, which means I'm reading Japanese books. I'm watching Japanese television. I'm looking at the internet in Japanese and so on. I even had Japanese like recorded like J-Wave radio programs so that I can listen to in my car while I'm driving to work. So there was a guy once upon a time that used to do a, he was like A-J-A-T-T -T on Twitter, all Japanese all the time. And he was living in America and basically, you know, surrounded himself by everything Japanese in his home. So that when he walked in, it was just like being in anywhere in Japan until he left again. And over the course of a year, it became almost 100 percent fluent in Japanese. And I was blown away. So I was trying to get like that guy and uh, another black guy, by the way. So uh, if you're if you're looking at this. Thank you, dog. I appreciate it because <laughs> you really inspire me, uh, which leads me to maybe my second my second point of advice. Use the Internet. Go out on a limb and take and shift your phone's operating system to Japanese. You know, instead of doing that Google search in English, do it in Japanese. Start now. You know, put those those apps on your phone and use them. OK, but, uh, you know, the biggest thing, I guess, would be just take that time and be strict about it set a reminder have a get a study buddy do whatever you have to do but it's just like working out if you want to be slim you go to a gym if you want to learn Japanese this is the same thing you got to do you got to make that gym for your mind in cyberspace I'm at Star Wolf I'm on Instagram I'm on Twitter I'm on Facebook I'm I'm everywhere reach out I'm a friendly person I don't bite if you have any uh, questions about Japan I'm also on Reddit too uh, username is Starwolf. If you want some advice about living here um, and want to ask detailed questions, go to the Tokyo and Japan and Japan Life subreddit as well. And me and a bunch of other guys will answer your questions. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see weekly videos about the black experience in Japan, feel free to subscribe to this channel. If you know someone that would like to be featured or if you yourself would like to be featured, send us a message on our Facebook page at The Black Experience Japan or send us a tweet on Twitter at The Black X JP. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.